Hello and good evening. Uh, my name is Jason Sandberg. I'm one of the urologists at uh, Michigan Institute of Urology. And I thank everybody for joining us tonight for this uh, discussion that I hopefully will be uh, informative, a little bit fun, uh, but mostly um, just uh, relaxed and, and, and laid back a little bit. You know, uh, tonight we're talking primarily about erectile dysfunction, which is a topic that affects many, many men and yet oftentimes is not talked about. And so part of this, uh, the objective of, of this evening's conversation is to try to break that stigma a little bit, have an open conversation, teach uh, everyone on the call a little something uh, new, hopefully, um, and then we'll answer some questions uh, potentially as we go, but also at the end. So um, we will uh, kind of just proceed with the program this evening. So uh, tonight's topic, as I said, is going to be primarily about the treatments that we can offer at Michigan Institute of Urology and through our um, sister clinic, Redeem, uh, which is our sexual health and wellness clinic um, for men at all stages of their journey uh, with erectile dysfunction. Just a little bit about me. Um, again, my name is Jason Sandberg. Um, I am a practicing urologist with Michigan Institute of Urology. Um, I grew up in South Florida in Boca Raton, but uh, I was born in Chicago, was always um, kind of uh, had my roots in the Midwest. And so I returned to um, Chicago and the Evanston era, area initially for um, college at Northwestern. I went to medical school at Northwestern, met my wife there, who was from the uh, Rochester, Michigan area. Um, and as we went through our journey with residency and training and finishing all that up, we ultimately decided that we wanted to end up back in this area. And so that's what brings me here. Um, along my journey in training to become a urologist, I did my residency at Wake Forest in North Carolina, which is a six-year program. I did an additional year of fellowship training in reconstructive urology, which included prosthetics, um, which um, you'll you'll see a little bit later in the talk as a, as a point of uh, treatment for a lot of men with erectile dysfunction. Um, and I've been here um, at the Michigan Institute of Urology for the past nearly four years now. Um, I do do a lot of penile implants. I also treat men with urethral stricture disease. I treat men with lower urinary tract uh, trauma in the past uh, requiring reconstruction. Do a lot of general urology too, so I deal with men with um, history of enlarged prostate, kidney stones, that kind of thing as well. And right now, I practice primarily out of the Troy um, and West Bloomfield office locations. So, just a little bit about erectile dysfunction, very basic stuff here. So, number one, what is it? All right, and there can be a wide definition of erectile dysfunction, but in a, in general, we talk about it in terms of the inability. Um, over time, so maybe not just a single episode, but consistent and persistent inability to either, either achieve or maintain an erection firm enough for sexual intercourse. Now that does vary widely based on one man's definition to another. And, and my definition tends to be, when does it become distressing to that man, right? Not every man is, is practicing penetrative intercourse, right? Some men are being sexually active in other ways, um, that is just as satisfying, but they're still not having erections to satisfy, um, you know, that need or the needs of their partner. And thus, you know, that's why the, the, the definition can be a little bit looser in some respects. So in my general, you know, uh, view of things, it's, it's a little bit uh, wider, array. Right? And those are any man who has a concern about and is experiencing those troubles deserves um, diagnosis and treatment. Um, so one of the questions that a lot of men ask me is how prevalent is it, right? And the, the overall answer is very, very prevalent. One in five men over the age of 20 will experience ED in their lifetime. And as we get older as men, that number goes up. So I typically use the, the kind of the, you know, general rule of thumb that if you take a guy's age, whatever that is, 40, 50, 60, 70, that's the percentage of men in that age group that are, have experienced or are experiencing erectile dysfunction. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, probably not, but there's almost 250 people logged into this call. And that's demonstrating to me, uh, as well as what I see in my everyday practice, that it is such a prevalent issue. Um, and yet, you know, most men aren't talking about it with their friends, their brothers, their, their dads, their sons, you know, because it's a personal issue. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect a lot of us, though. <clears throat> so some of the basics to understand about an erection. In general, there's a few things that are required for erection, right? There's, in most cases, arousal, but we all know as men that sometimes an erection can come spontaneously, or maybe it did at one time in our lives. 
Um, but what it ultimately comes down to is the ability to get blood into the penis and keep that blood in the penis, right? So when we become aroused, nerve stimulation is required to tell the body to bring that blood into the penis. And so healthy nerves are one thing. Um, healthy blood flow and healthy blood vessels are another thing. Um, and then the ability of the veins that allow normally blood to leave the penis, well, we, when we have an erection, we want those veins to be compressible, nice and pliable, nice and healthy, so that they can actually um, be compressed and not allow blood to flow directly out of the penis. And so sometimes we find that there's a nerve problem, a blood vessel problem, a medication problem, a side effect for medication, things like that, um, that could be contributing. Common causes of erectile dysfunction. Um, you know, I mentioned medications are a big one. Um, there's a whole gamut of medications, including blood pressure medications, pain medications, um, medications for diabetes or potentially diabetes itself um, that can cause it. Prior pelvic surgery is a big one. You know, primarily I see a lot of guys with a history of prostate cancer, and they may have gone to have prostate cancer treated with radiation or having the prostate removed surgically with a prostatectomy. Um, but there are other pelvic surgeries that sometimes men have to undergo that involve the bladder or the colon um, or other um, ailments that will affect their ability to get an erection as well. Um, medical causes, including low testosterone, either sort of for reasons that we don't quite understand or directly due to prior trauma, removal of a testicle, um, chemotherapy treatments required for cancers, um, might leave a man with erectile dysfunction. Radiation therapy, um, two organs within the pelvis that might affect the nerves is also possible. Um, and that we know that there's a, you know, a big mental health component to it as well. And so depression and anxiety contribute directly. Oftentimes medications that are used to treat depression and anxiety can uh, contribute as well. So most of the time, though, you know, out of all those things I mentioned, there's actually about 70% of men with erectile dysfunction who have other underlying health issues that are the major cause when we look at all men in the population, you know, strictly speaking more, more with the United States. Um, but when we look at the United States men's population, about 70% of men with erectile dysfunction have um, other underlying health issues like peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, heart disease, a history of obesity, um, which can all be contributors. One of the most common questions I get is, hey, Dr. Sandberg, what is it in me that's causing this, right? And usually the answer is multiple things um, that are all kind of adding up together. In other cases, I look at a guy who's perfectly healthy otherwise and is still dealing with it. And sometimes we can't actually answer that question. Um, but the good news is we've got um, um, pretty good overall treatments to try to help with it. So that starts in my clinic with counseling about improving overall health in men and whom I think that can be beneficial. All right. And so these tend to be things that you've probably heard many times throughout your life from other physicians, from school growing up, things like that. But in general, we want to have a healthy diet. Um, and, and have a nutritious diet. Um, that's going to help us avoid things or better control things that we might already have, like diabetes and heart disease. Exercise is a big one. Exercise helps to build lean muscle mass. It helps to naturally raise testosterone levels. It helps to um, allow us to get our blood flow circulating and give us a, a healthier heart. Um, weight loss, if indicated in a, in a specific man, can be helpful too. Um, but the other things that are lifestyle associated, like drinking alcohol on a regular basis, smoking on a regular basis, um, those can have a big impact if we're able to dial that back or even, you know, quit those things completely. Stress is another big one. I, I have seen um, a number of younger men in my clinic in recent years, meaning below the age of 40, some guys in their 20s. And I think uh, whether or not the pandemic uh, or whatever it might be over the past several years has contributed to that. But I've definitely seen a big uptick in men who are going through stressful situations, anxiety, um, difficulties with work-life balance, things like that. And I've worked with men to try to help them deal with that too. And for that reason, sometimes I also will include um, the referral to a therapist or even a sexual therapist for some men who might benefit from that. Sleep is another big one that we often don't talk about that much, but if you're not getting good sleep, that can be a big contributor to erectile dysfunction because the body needs that time to actually, you know, um, rest, to regenerate, to kind of get itself ramped back up. And in men who are having difficulty sleeping um, due to 
again, either stress or anxiety or other medical conditions like obstructive sleep apnea that's either gone undiagnosed or undertreated, that can be a big, um, you know, consideration. So when we talk about urologic issues related to erectile dysfunction, I often will see men with multiple other conditions um, that are strictly related to urology um, that, that we'll be addressing at the same time. I already mentioned testosterone. And so the typical evaluation for men when I see them for the first time is uh, to do a physical exam, take a good history, but also check hormonal labs, including testosterone, but other hormones that might be sent down from the brain um, that could affect directions like prolactin, follicle stimulating hormone, and, and luteinizing hormone. Uh, Peyronie's disease, which you may be familiar with, which is essentially curvature of the penis, which may or may not be associated with a plaque or an area within the, the penile tissues that make it harder or more difficult to a certain part of it to expand, sometimes go hand in hand with erectile dysfunction. Um, and prostate cancer, which I already mentioned, is probably one of the number one reasons why I see men with pretty severe erectile dysfunction if they're having long-lasting erectile dysfunction after being treated for prostate cancer. In general, low testosterone is defined by a laboratory test. Uh, we do a blood test. It's best done first thing in the morning before 10 a.m. is the, the time of day where I usually like to get it for men. Um, we do know that as we get older, our testosterone naturally goes down. And so just as erectile dysfunction increases in the population as we get older, low testosterone increases as well. Um, it is, we do see higher rates of this in men who are obese, men with history of diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease. And thus, sometimes as a secondary effect of those disease having low testosterone, sometimes they can have direct effect on the ability to get an erection, but we try to you know, kind of take a look at everything um, altogether. Oftentimes when I see men who do have low T, they're also complaining of other symptoms such as fatigue, loss of energy, difficulty in keeping up with their workouts in the gym like they normally do or have in the fat in the past. Um, they may have a decreased libido. They may have difficulty concentrating, a whole gamut of, uh, of symptoms that, that can be addressed too if we are able to diagnose low testosterone and then provide that testosterone back to them in some way, shape, or form with uh, medication. Um, medications come in a different, uh, all different varieties. Um, there are gels that can be rubbed on the skin on a daily basis. There are now newer oral pills that can be taken, nasal sprays, patches, pellets, injections. There's a lot of ways to get uh, men testosterone. And we talk about all that. Uh, sometimes it's somewhat dictated by insurance coverage. Um, it's also dictated by lifestyle and what men prefer in terms of how they like to get it. Um, and, and in some cases, if low T is the main thing that's contributing to erectile dysfunction, then treating the low T will help uh, improve erectile strength and, and maintenance. And, and sometimes that's all, all men will actually really need. So that's a big one. Um, I did mention Peyronie's disease a little bit before. Um, you know, that could be an entire discussion in and of itself in terms of Peyronie's disease. But what I will say, uh, uh, at least for today, is that if you do have difficulty with an erection, but when you actually are able to get an erection, if you've got curvature, if you've got bending, if you've got pain with erection, that's another thing that we can talk about that really... Um, you know, can take on a whole uh, range of treatment options as well, depending on the specifics of how a man presents. Um, this is the typical picture that, that a man might see with Peyronie's disease. Um, it's demonstrating here a plaque or basically scar tissue that forms around the rectile body of the penis. And essentially what happens is it doesn't allow the penis, the erectile body to expand symmetrically. So instead of symmetrically expanding out, um, in a way and growing both in length and girth during an erection, there's some type of restriction that's occurring and then the, the, the penile tissues have nowhere else to go, so they have to curve. Um, and so there is injection therapy to try to help dissolve the plaque. There's physical or traction therapy to try to break, break that plaque up. And then uh, in, in more severe cases, there's uh, surgery. In the case of both Peyronie's and severe erectile dysfunction in which we're not able to improve the erectile function with medication alone, then sometimes the best thing to do is actually go straight to placing a penile implant. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but that is something that can be done um, for certain uh, cases. Prostate cancer, as I mentioned before, is a big one. Um, and that's because the nerves that are responsible for erectile function run right along the kind of outside and the backside of the prostate. And so 
um, inevitably, uh, not inevitably because it doesn't happen in all men, but oftentimes when treatment is given for prostate cancer, whether that be surgery or radiation, uh, brachytherapy, which is seed implant, which I also put under the, the realm of radiation, those nerves can be damaged and they can lead to permanent erectile dysfunction. Um, and so um, in those cases, some men are still responsive to sort of standard treatments, but other times we do have to go on and put in that penile prosthesis for them if they're not responding. With the big takeaway from this discussion that I want everyone to understand is that if you're suffering with erectile dysfunction, there are treatment options. And in almost every case, depending on your goals and how far you'd like to take treatment, um, it can be cured, you know, essentially one way or another. Um, again, sometimes that ends in surgery or injection or things that aren't necessarily palatable to some men. Um, but that's the discussion that we have. And the, the most important thing to know is the options are there. And then you're able and allowed to take it as far as you want to. I've got plenty of guys who come to me, we go over the options and I say, you know what, I appreciate the information, but I don't really want to pursue that, that aggressively. And I say to them, that's okay. Right. And I've got other guys who say, I'd rather die. You know, literally I've had a couple of guys tell me this, I'd rather die than um, continue living this way. And then I know that's the guy that we're going to, you know, take as far as we need to, to help get him um, better erections. So overall, and, and these are things that I talk to men about when they come to see me, um, there's multi, there are multiple facets of treatment for erectile dysfunction. Some of these things can be pursued simultaneously and other others I tend to bring men um, down in more of a stepwise manner. Try one thing first. If that doesn't work, move on to the next and, and so forth. Um, oral medications, those are the things like Viagra, Cialis, Levitra that most men have probably heard of by this point. A vacuum erection device or an external penis pump to help draw blood into the penis. Low intensity shockwave therapy, which is a kind of a newer, um, I think it's been out for quite a while now, but um, of all the um, treatments is one of the newer ones out there on the market. Um, injections into the penis, there's a couple of different options for that. And then the penile implant surgery. Um, I would add to that oral medication, you know, again, we talked about low T, but, you know, testosterone is another potential medication that can be um, adjunctive here. So in general, you know, the medications that we think about that come to mind, Viagra, also called Sildenafil, or Cialis, also called Tadalafil, or Levitra, which is called Vardenafil, um, those are the, probably the most common ones out there that most guys have heard of. And in general, what they do is they help try to increase blood flow to the penis by preventing the body from breaking down nitric oxide, which is the main neurotransmitter that helps to get blood there in the first place. It's effective for most men. And I say most because, you know, most guys, if they've never tried it before, we put them on a dose. Um, we ramp them up if they need to be to a, to a maximum or a higher dose. Most are going to respond in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but there are men in whom um, it's not as useful. And those are, tend to be the guys with um, either severe diabetes or guys who've had prior surgery where the true reason for it is anatomic. You know, those nerves have been injured and thus... Um, no matter what medication we give them, it's not going to necessarily fix the problem because the medication works by sort of supporting the nerves. And if the nerves aren't really there any longer to begin with, then it's not going to work. Um, you know, insurance coverage is a big thing here. And what I'll tell every guy is at least right now, it's always changing, but um, there are ways that we can get these medications for relatively inexpensively. There are a couple of websites out there. GoodRx is one of them that tends to get guys that's a little bit cheaper because most insurance companies will cover these pills, but they may only cover six of them a month, you know, or four of them a month or something like that. And for some men, that's okay, right? But some men want to be sexually active more than once a week. And in that case, if the pills are working, they're going to need more and then they can become more expensive more quickly. So, you know, I would never want cost for one of these pills, which are now generic and can be had relatively inexpensively to be a, the major barrier. And we can find ways to help you with that if that's a concern. Side effects with these medications um, are relatively common. They're relatively minor for most guys, although I've had a few say, hey, I get such a bad headache with Viagra, or such bad, um, you know, it's not on this list, but such bad um, acid reflux or something like that, where they can't take it or it's not worth it for them to take it. And, and that may be a sign that we've got to try something else, right? So we're always on the lookout for side effects when we're starting new medications. Um, the major difference between the two most common medications we use, Viagra and, and Cialis, are the time in which they work. 
Viagra is a little bit more rapid acting. It reaches peak uh, concentrations in the blood a little bit more quickly, and it leaves the, the, the body a little bit more quickly than Cialis. And so for that reason, Cialis can last a little longer. It's approved for daily dosing, even on days when you're not necessarily sexually active. Um, but some guys respond better to one versus the other. And quite honestly, it's a little bit of a trial and error situation. So I always tell guys when they first come to see me, I've got plenty of guys who said, I've tried Viagra, it doesn't work. The first thing quite honestly I do is we try Cialis and we see if that works. And we don't really know why, but for about 50% in whom one won't work, the other will. And so it's always worth a try in my opinion. Um, the vacuum device or a penis pump, you know, this, these are devices, they're cylinders, they're placed over the penis and they manually cause negative pressure like a vacuum. They draw blood into the penis. Oftentimes guys are using these with oral pills as well. And oftentimes they're using them with a, a penile ring at the base to maintain the blood inside the penis once it gets in there. Um, but, you know, they're clunky, they're big. It takes a minute to, to actually use them. Um, oftentimes guys will get an erection decent in the beginning, but it won't last. And then of course, you know, there's not spontaneity there. It's not like you're, you're just, you know, kind of getting in the mood. Things are starting and you're able to go. You got to say, Hey, give me a minute. I got to go over here. I got to unzip my thing. I got to, you know, get my device on and, and do it. Now, I mean, I met plenty of guys who go, they involve their partner in that and they have fun with it. And, you know, for, for those guys, it works, but, um, depending on where you're at with your relationship with somebody else or whether you're single or whatever it is, it's maybe not always feasible. So um, we always mention it and bring it up, um, but we understand it's not necessarily going to work for every guy. Um, this is just sort of a demonstration of what it looks like. Nowadays, it's nice because there's battery powered ones, so you don't have to manually pump it. Um, you know, so it's relatively simple, but it's still something that can be a little bit cumbersome sometimes for guys. So one of the newer, more exciting things out there on the market is this low intensity shockwave therapy. Um, this has been looked at now for quite a while. There have been some research studies done on it, and we offer this through our practice at the Redeem Clinic. Um, in general, the first sort of treatment uh, pathway is to do six sessions, one time a week for six weeks. They take about 15, 20 minutes a piece. And most importantly, that a lot of guys ask for, it's not painful. So similar to an ultrasound wand that you might have put on your body to look at a picture of your kidney or your liver or something like that. We use ultrasound uh, waves not to look at a picture, but to actually deliver a low intensity shock wave. What it does is it allows the uh, penis to absorb this wave and stimulates blood flow and blood vessel growth. Um, and, and men have had um, pretty good responses to that. In some cases, it can require uh, maintenance treatments, you know, several months later or a few times a year to maintain the benefit, but it's nice because it's non-invasive um, and it doesn't um, cause any pain. So when you have this done, you actually come to the clinic. One of our therapists will actually do the, they'll perform the procedure um, for you. Um, and uh, the name of the device that we use is called Duolith. You might see it out there in the community under another name called Gainswave, but Duolith in particular, we believe uh, the, the machine itself, the unit itself has the best combination of depth of penetration and wave strength to be the most effective possible. And so uh, in men who I see that are, uh, you know, uh, interested in this, we will get them set up with an appointment at our Redeem Clinic and undergo the treatments. They still are under my care. They'll follow up with me. We'll still um, continue to monitor and work on things with them. Um, if they're not as successful as they want to be, but it's always um, uh, worth a try, in my opinion. The other thing um, that um, uh, we can do if these other options have been attempted and have not been successful is to take out what I call sort of the, the digestion and metabolism required with the pills and just go straight to the source. So that is, that's when we talk about doing injections of medication straight into the penis. Injections can be given as a combination of either two, three, or four drugs at a time with increasing dosages as we go. We typically always start with a lower dose and try to work our way up until we find the injection um, strength and concentration that's right for you um, with the idea that we want to try to get an erection that will last about 30 to 60 minutes. Um, one of the reasons why we tend to use these things in men is because, like I said, if they're having side effects with pills, if they've 
tried Viagra, Cialis, they've tried other methods and they're not working. Oftentimes, most guys will be very successful um, with this method. The downside to it is you've got to literally take out a syringe with a needle and you've got to stick yourself in the penis with the um, needle and then inject the drug. Um, so it's a little pinch there to do it. Many guys uh, balk at it at the beginning, but in those guys who are successful, they actually really like it because it's giving them a natural blood flow erection that they can maintain and be you know, satisfied with in terms of sexual activity. The idea behind it is that you're going to inject the medication directly into the erectile body. Although in this photo, you can see it's kind of like, uh, um, you know, the inside of a penis. If you were to cut it in half, there's like two eyes and a mouth. So the two eyes there are the erectile bodies and the mouth is the urethra where you pee out of. But the erectile bodies that you are uh, using to get an erection, they, they look like they're separate in this photo, but they actually do communicate. So you only need to give yourself an injection in one side and the blood will flow and it will get over to the other side. Um, usually you've got to do that about 10 to 15 minutes before you want to be sexually active. So it does require a little bit of planning. Um, and, uh, in most cases, you know, trust with your partner to say, Hey, I've got to go do this. So give me a second. Right. Um, most of these do need to be refrigerated and many have a shelf life of maybe only 30 to 60 days. And so if you have any, haven't used it, then you have to get a refill and all that kind of stuff. So there's a little bit of planning around it, but when used, uh, appropriately and responsibly, I, a lot of guys, do quite well with it. Um, you know, I do see though quite a bit of men, and that's why I specialized in this uh, in, in fellowship in terms of learning how to do processes, work on complex cases, and all that kind of stuff. Because even after all these treatments we've uh, discussed, um, there are still men who don't have success. And um, even with injections, um, even with pills, even with um, Duolith and everything else, they're still not getting erections. Sometimes that's immediate, right? They've developed erectile dysfunction. We try all this stuff over the course of six months and no success. Other guys, they've been doing injections for 10 years and now they're not working any longer or whatever it is. So wherever that man might be along his journey with this, it's always possible to consider putting in a penile implant. Um, the main thing about a penile implant is it's a big step, right? I mean, it's surgery. We have to, we put you under anesthesia. We're placing an external device into the penis. We've got some visuals and some videos coming up here as well to show you. Um, and so, you know, when we do place an implant, we talk about quite a bit, you know, what are, what are the expectations for surgery, for recovery, for all that kind of stuff. Um, in general, it's a very, very safe procedure. You know, we are operating on a sensitive area, you know, which is the penis, but we're not operating on or near any, you know, vital structures. We're not inside the belly. We're not you know, up in the chest or anything like that. And so from that standpoint, it's very, very safe. Um, risk of complications is very low. The one that I concern myself most with really is infection. If, if the device becomes infected, then it needs to be removed surgically. And the big thing about doing these surgeries, and I tell every guy, you only want to go forward with it if you're absolutely sure you've tried everything else, or at least you've convinced yourself that you've tried what you wanted and they haven't worked. Because once we put this implant in, we are obliterating your erectile tissue, and we, uh, if we ever had to take it out in the future, um, it, you would never be able to get an erection again on your own. And thus, we're in a situation where once you do it, you can't really go back. But with that said, satisfaction rates are extremely high. Um, the most recent data I'm familiar with shows satisfaction rates of 95%. Um, partner satisfaction rates, just as importantly, are around 90% in terms of the patient's partners who they're sexually active with are also satisfied with the implant. The best part about it is you can basically pump up the implant with the inflatable devices, give yourself an erection. It'll last as long as you want. Um, you can have an orgasm um, and it'll still stay up. Um, and whenever you're done, you can deflate it and bring it down. And so there's reliability there. There's consistency there. Um, and so it, it, it definitely, when, when we place them in men who are really not having success in any other realm, it can be sort of a life-changing thing um, for them. So in general, the most common type of implant that I place is a, and this is true for kind of across the board of, of any of all urologists in the country, the most common type of implant that's put in is a, a three-piece inflatable implant. That's what's pictured here. The, the three-piece is, is for the cylinders that go into the erectile bodies themselves, the pump that is placed down in the scrotum near the testicles, and the reservoir, which holds salt water in it. So the whole thing is run on salt water so that if, for example, something happened to 
uh, the device, you were in an accident, the device ruptured, the fluid leaked out, it's perfectly safe, it's not gonna harm you. There are other types of devices. There's a malleable device that is more of like a semi-rigid rod. Those are best for men who don't have the hand dexterity to actually be able to pump it up, which might be men with other conditions like multiple sclerosis or prior stroke or, or um, you know, a spinal cord injury. Um, uh, and so while they're not usually rated as highly in terms of satisfaction rates, they are still very, very, um, you know, an important part of treatment for, for a lot of men. Um, I did want to show you a video here real quick because I think this also highlights quite a bit in terms of what the implant is. So what we'll do here is see if I can actually hit the thing to get it to start. Here we go. So this is showing essentially what it looks like inside after it's been implanted. So the man is squeezing the pump. With every pump, it moves a little bit more fluid into those cylinders and then the cylinders expand. So you do have to typically give yourself about 15, 10 to 15 pumps to kind of get the implant fully inflated. And there's a little button on the pump. And when you press the button, it deflates and the fluid goes the opposite direction and then goes back into the reservoir. So I think it's kind of a helpful um, visual just to kind of see what it actually looks like. You'll notice that the penis itself goes internal into the body pretty far. So about half of our penis is outside our body. The other half is inside. Um, and when we place the implant, we custom fit it to your body, meaning that when we make the incision, we open up the erectile bodies and we measure it to the tip all the way internal. And so we put in the largest implant we possibly can, but we do custom fit it within five millimeters um, to every uh, patient. So in that way, it is um, custom to you. And so... Um, I did as well, and I know there's a few questions on the queue here, so I'm going to answer the questions, but I did bring as well, um, just to show you, and if you come to clinic, we'd have this too, uh, but this is an actual implant, um, that we put in patients. So this is a reservoir. You can see how floppy it is. It's made out of silicone. It's kind of like a thick water balloon. These are the cylinders. You can also see how floppy the cylinders are when they're deflated. Now this device doesn't actually have any fluid in it, so I can't inflate it for you, but they're very, very malleable. And so when you have it put in, you're walking around your daily life, you're exercising, doing what you're doing. Nobody knows the difference. And in fact, even if you were undressed in a locker room somewhere, once you recover from surgery, no one be, would be able to tell you have it in. Um, and then this is the pump part of it. And so that's what you'd be doing. You'd be inflating here. And then this little button on top is the part where you press in to deflate. So this is the whole device that we implant surgically, usually through a single incision beneath the penis where it meets the scrotum. Um, but occasionally you've got to make a separate incision up in the lower abdomen to get this reservoir piece in. All depends on your surgical history and what your abdomen kind of looks like. Um, so as far as the slides go, that is the sort of end of things. But I did want to address a couple of questions um, in the uh, queue here. So um, first question we got, um, is from a gentleman who says he's 69 years old. I'm wondering if I recommend getting a stress test. I still get erections with some difficulty. So uh, I think with stress tests, he's probably referring to a cardiac stress test. Um, again, we mentioned cardiovascular um, disease as being a possible, having a possible association with erectile dysfunction. So what I'd say is in general, um, in a man who's otherwise healthy with no cardiac history presenting with erectile dysfunction, it's not standard workup to, to get a stress test. However, if there are any symptoms of, you know, worsening shortness of breath, chest pain, um, you know, difficulty climbing stairs or, or, or doing physical activity that you could do six months ago that you can't do now, you know, that would be a consideration. I don't typically order a stress test myself. That would be something I'd, I'd have you have that conversation with either your primary care doctor or, you know, certainly if you're already under the care of a cardiologist, then you, you would likely have a cardiac history and you'd discuss it with them. Um, but if we were to ever go on to do something more advanced in terms of treatments, such as um, placement of a penile implant and you need surgery and there was any question about your cardiac health, then absolutely we'd have you be seen and cleared for surgery. And in some cases they need a, a stress test or an echocardiogram or something before we even do surgery, not only to clear you for surgery, but just to make sure that that's not a contributor to, to what's going on. Um, the other question is, what is the success rates of Duolith? Um, so the success rates of Duolith 
um, are known quite well in the short term, but they're not known all that well in the long term, meaning 5, 10, 15 years out, because it hasn't really been out that long in terms of having data and having research studies to show that. When we look at research studies and we look at men who have had it done and then we follow them up six months and 12 months later, success rates as defined by sort of a statistically, but also a clinically significant improvement in erectile dysfunction around 75%. Um, and that runs the gamut from like great improvement, don't even need to use any other medications. Viagra Cialis are, are really doing well with it to guys who say there's definite improvement. I feel my erections are better, but I might still need to use uh, Viagra Cialis, but at a lower dose um, or, or something like that. And so I do tell every guy, you know, even though success rates are relatively high, there are still, you know, some men who have the treatment and, and don't respond just like every other treatment we can offer for erectile dysfunction. And so they have to be aware of that possibility going in. And unfortunately, right now, we don't have a great way of predicting who may respond and who may not. Um, and so um, I'm hoping one day we'll get there where we might have a, a lab test or an imaging test or something that might be able to say, all right, you're the perfect guy for this. But as of right now, um, we don't. Um, the other question, uh, another one asks, uh, my urologist seemed to cast shade on the implant idea. He said that once it fails, your, your member is basically just like an empty sock. <laughs> I like the way that he put that and posed the question. Um, I would say, so in one respect, that's true, right? If the implant fails, then you're left with a non-functioning, you know, penis that can't get an erection. In general, average lifespan of the implant before it mechanically fails is 10 to 12 years. And newer studies are suggesting with the newer implants, it might even be closer to 15 years. Um, but it doesn't mean that all hope is lost because, and I've done this many times for men, including one guy in his mid eighties who was still sexually active. Um, I took the old implant out and I put a new one in. So yes, it requires another surgery, but it doesn't mean that you, you're, that all is lost. Now, like I said, uh, when we do put an implant in, it does mean there's no going back in terms of being responsive to medications or injections or anything like that anymore. So from, from that standpoint, that's true. Um, but, uh, I, uh, have had men in my office crying with joy, um, you know, three months after I put an implant in because it's changed their life for the better. So, um, you know, I, I would not agree that, uh, you know, that the implant is, is a, is a bad idea. Um, you know, for most men, um, for some guys it is though. And if, if I think it is not a good idea for you from a health standpoint, from my, from your ability to withstand surgery, or I think your complication risk is too high, I'll tell you that. Um, but for most men, I think it's a great thing, which is why I've sort of dedicated my life to it. Um, can lumbar fusions cause easy ED? Um, not, so I can't say hundred percent yes or no, but we do know that, you know, when you're dealing with lumbar fusions, which are usually performed for disc disease or herniations or things like that around the spinal cord and the vertebrae, um, you know, nerves are in general, very, very important for erectile function. So, um, you know, anything that's potentially affecting nerve signals, transmission from the brain down to the nerves, um, in the, the pelvis, um, and, and specifically those, uh, responsible for erections could affect that, but I can't say with any degree of certainty that a specific, um, uh, lumbar fusion could directly cause it. Um, it's certainly possible that it could be, uh, you know, a secondary effect from the spinal issue in general. Um, gels, are any gels or creams available to get an erection? So not in the United States by prescription. There are some gels that can be rubbed on the penis that I know are available, like in the United Kingdom and in parts of Europe. Um, I've had a couple guys inquire about those and I've tried to write prescriptions a couple of times. So far, no success on that. Um, doesn't mean you might not be able to get your hands on it another way, but as of right now, nothing that we can actually directly prescribe or get our hands on in the United States. Um, what blood pressure medications impact erections? Um, in general, the answer to that is all of them. Um, you know, I'd say the most common ones, the ones that have the greatest effect are probably those that are beta blockers like metoprolol or atenolol. Uh, but any type of medication that affects the blood pressure could theoretically affect erections. Again, this is one of those things there's no clear test for. We can't say, all right, you started this medication. Now let's do a blood test and see if it affects your erections. Uh, but we can see a correlation between guys who have, you know, uh, who have started blood pressure medication, then rates of erectile dysfunction go up in a reasonably 
a short period of time. It's not like decades later where we could blame it on age, but you know, it could be due to the blood pressure medications. And I've seen men with, you know, one blood pressure medication. I've seen guys on four and five blood pressure medications because their blood pressure is out of control. Um, you know, and then quite honestly, you have to say, well, is erectile dysfunction because the blood pressure is out of control or is it the medication causing it? And I don't know the answer to that because by that point you're taking so many that it could be both. Um, but, um, we know it's a risk factor. Inflatable device, uh, is the inflatable device or IPP is what I typically call it. Uh, inflatable penile prosthesis covered by my insurance. Most of the time, the answer to that question is yes, it's covered by Medicare and Medicare is sort of the benchmark by which all major insurance carriers, um, sort of design their coverage. I've come across a couple of um, smaller niche insurance plan where it's specifically not covered and it's excluded. And I've done a, a few of them on men who have paid cash. And in general, the total cost for, you know, surgery, the implant itself, anesthesia, hospital, all that stuff, it's going to run forty to $50,000 out of pocket. So it's not cheap. But most guys who have it, it is covered by insurance and their out-of-pocket costs are running somewhere between two and $3,000. So, you know, we, we will always look into that. If we decide to put an implant in, we will get prior authorization and we'll, we'll make sure it's covered before we proceed. Um, but yeah, surprisingly to a lot of guys, it is covered by uh, most insurance plans. Um, are any natural vitamins, fruits, veggies you've heard that have some level of effectiveness? Quite honestly, the answer that's no. I mean, to the extent that you can eat healthy, um, you know, take multivitamins, all that kind of stuff. I think that is great overall for your health, but there's nothing specifically that's been proven by scientific study to, um, you know, impact erections directly. And so, you know, that's why we talk a lot, a, a lot about, um, you know, the things that we can do from a medical standpoint, prescriptions and all that kind of stuff. And I'm fully on board with trying to improve things from a natural and holistic standpoint, but we don't have the evidence to say that that works. Not to say that some guys don't come in and swear by a particular supplement or something that they've taken, but when we've looked at a lot of them, and they're not all studied, but a lot of them in studies have not shown any major difference. Um, next question, is the penis pump located inside or outside the skin? Yeah, so it's all inside. I mean, that's the best part of this. This is all internal. Um, if you, once you have an implant put in and you're healed up um, and, you know, you're going about your life, if someone really looked close, probably a urologist, they'd probably be able to tell you had one in maybe, um, you're, you would be able to feel it. I kind of, I usually describe it, even though it's all internal, I describe it to most guys, like it being like wearing a watch, you know, like most of the time or your wedding ring, you know, you, you, you go out, um, in your daily life. And for the most part, you never really notice it's there, but if you look down you feel it, you see it, you know that you're wearing a watch obviously, but it doesn't bother you during the day. Same thing with the implant. If you feel the penis, if you grab it, if you're looking for the components, yes, you'll be able to feel them, but they're not going to be something that you can readily sort of detect or that you're going to be bothered by in your day-to-day -day life while you're doing other things. Um, does the injections into the penis keep the penis hard after orgasm? Also, do pellets work better than testosterone injections? Uh, multiple questions here, so I'll start with a couple. Do injections of the penis keep penis hard after orgasm? For most men, yes. Usually, they're going to um, you know, last for a certain amount of time, and we try to titrate it to that time. But every man has a built-in refractory period. Once you have an orgasm, your brain actually releases neurotransmitters to bring the erection down and stop it. So sometimes the injections are strong enough to maintain it um, even after an orgasm. But it's not uncommon for you to lose a little bit of strength of the erection after the injection. But there's a lot more guys who will maintain it while they're using injections than if they were just taken by agrocialis or something like that. Pellets, do they work better for testosterone than testosterone injection? I want to say they work better or worse. They're just different. Testosterone injections need to be given at a minimum of once every two weeks. Um, some men will do them once every week or once every few days, depending on their dosage. Um, but testosterone pellets are usually given once every three months or once every six months. And so the difference is how often you need to have them done. Men can give testosterone injections to themselves where the pellets are typically given, you know, you come into the office and it's a small little procedure where we insert them. So it all comes down to guy's lifestyle. I wouldn't say either one's better or worse because they'll both get the testosterone, you know, up, but it's just a question of which you, whatever you prefer. Um, and then um, one, one, he also said, I did gains wave. If I did do a lift, would it get better? Assuming that you did gains wave and it didn't do anything, then would doing dual lift get better? Quite honestly, probably not. 
Um, you know, I can't say for sure, but, you know, assuming that they followed a standardized treatment protocol with gains wave and um, did it properly, it's, if you really had no benefit at all from it, it's unlikely that Duolith is going to help you um, at that point, I would say. Um, any potential solutions compatible or incompatible with an enlarged prostate? So in general, enlarged prostate is sort of, uh, even though we know there's an association between enlarged prostate and erectile dysfunction in terms of them being at higher risk, um, they're really treated sort of separately. Um, the main sort of point at which they cross over is when we treat guys with large prostates with things like alpha blocker medication like Flomax or you might see Tamsulosin, um, Alphazosin, Doxazosin, things like that, or Finasteride or Dutasteride, which are medications to shrink the prostate. Um, those can cause erectile dysfunction in some cases as a side effect. Um, but in terms of like treatments or solutions being compatible. The only one that's technically approved is Tadalafil or Cialis, which can be given every day as a five milligram dose for BPH and, and urinary tract symptoms, but will also, in a lot of men, help with their erectile function too. So that's kind of the, the true answer is, is, is Cialis. Sometimes we can do some things with the dosing of, of Viagra too, where it's got a similar effect, but it's really just that medication where there's crossover. Um, I will say too, depending on if you needed surgical treatment for an enlarged prostate, there are some surgical treatments that will better preserve erectile and ejaculatory function than others. And so if you're an equally good candidate for one procedure compared to another, that's something to talk to your urologist about in terms of, you know, which one is going to preserve my sexual function the best way. Um, that sort of thing. Is there a risk of using sildenafil with blood pressure medication like carvedilol, diltiazem, or flecainide? Um, not a major risk as long as you're stable on those medications and your and your blood pressure is not super labile. So, you know, if you're taking a blood pressure medication and you've got well controlled blood pressure, you're not having major highs or lows throughout the day. You're not having dizziness or symptoms that would suggest low blood pressure. You can safely take sildenafil. The, the, the main medication that is contraindicated in would be guys who are using nitrates occasionally. If they get chest pain or angina, um, then you don't want to be using sildenafil at the same time. Uh, but for, for kind of standard blood pressure meds, it's okay. Metformin, not going to necessarily cause erectile problem, but that is a medication used to treat diabetes. Um, and so it's not a known real contributor to erectile dysfunction, but diabetes itself could be associated or be a cause. Um, so that's something to think about. Does tamsulosin affect, which is a blood, I'm sorry, which is a medication given for enlarged prostate. Does tamsulosin affect the ability to get an erection ejaculation? Yes, it does. So, um, tamsulosin has the lowest effect on guys, blood pressure as a side effect. So some guys with tamsulosin or other alpha blockers will get dizzy or lightheaded. So for that reason, it's the lowest risk of that happening, but it has the highest risk of retrograde ejaculation, which is have an orgasm, um, but no fluid comes out. And that's due to the, the way that it affects the muscles and the muscle relaxation. And so your, your muscle, your bulbospongiosis muscle can't squeeze to get the, the fluid out. Um, but there is a slight association with erectile dysfunction as well. And so some guys will start tamsulosin and feel like their erections are weaker. So yes, there's, a, there's an association there. Um, is surgery painful? Um, yeah, it, it, it is. Um, and, and I say that a little bit in jest, but it's an incision. Uh, where we're putting an implant and we're dilating the erectile bodies. The first week or so after a penile implant surgery um, is not like terribly painful. It's not like having big abdominal surgery, but you know, there's some pain, there's some swelling, there's some bruising that, that requires recovery. So, you know, I really try to tell guys not to be doing any major physical activity, take off some work if time from work, if they can. Um, I do the surgery the same way every time um, though. So I find it interesting that um, I saw a gentleman earlier today in my clinic and uh, I did his surgery three weeks ago and he goes, yeah, a little bruising, swelling. I was fine. Like no big deal. Took some Tylenol. And I've seen other guys where they really, they kind of struggle with the recovery for five days, six days, seven days afterwards. Um, not that it's terrible, terrible, but just that, you know, they're, they're a little more uh, swollen and pain, painful than they thought they might be. Um, and I've yet to figure out why that is. Cause again, I do it the same steps, same way every time. Uh, but I think there are some men who are just a little bit more sensitive to pain than others. Is shockwave covered by insurance? So in reference to dual lift, great question, it is not currently covered by insurance. 
Um, doesn't mean it's not a good therapy, but right now, because it's relatively new, which is usually the case with relatively newer technologies, insurance carriers are, are kind of uh, slower to pick it up. And so right now it's not covered by insurance. It's paid out of pocket. Um, at, at our Redeem Clinic, last I checked, the, the initial six treatments were being offered for about $2,400, which is far greater than uh, some of the clinics that we've seen out in the community charging $10,000 for this treatment. And so, you know, I, I would, if any man is interested in it, I would encourage them to at least have a consultation. It does not in any way commit you to, uh, you know, moving forward, but could at least learn more about the specific options. Um, prices, by the way, can change at, at certain times. So um, keep that in mind that that may not be the current price. Um, can I use the injection with Viagra Cialis? So I've got some patients who do this. I, I proceed in that way with caution because the risk of priapism or having an erection that lasts more than four hours that can become painful um, is higher if you're using both. And technically it's recommended not to do both. But some men have had limited success with just one or the other, and they feel that using both really gives them that benefit. Um, priapism is a problem because if you actually do develop that condition, that means blood is trapped in the penis and it's not being oxygenated. Nothing is cycling through and it can actually kill the erectile tissue. So in a worst case scenario, it can lead to permanent erectile dysfunction. And that's what we got to warn guys about. So if you find yourself in that scenario where you've got an erection lasting longer than four hours, you need to go to the emergency room so that either medications or in some cases, surgery can be performed to get the erection to come down. Can excessive bicycle riding affect nerves causing ED? Not that I'm aware of, you know, certainly being on a bike seat for long periods of time is kind of in that perineum area beneath the scrotum. It's putting pressure on the prostate area, um, but we don't have any evidence to suggest that it's um, going to cause erectile dysfunction. If anything, in a lot of ways, guys who are avid cyclists because they're, they tend to be in pretty good shape and, uh, and have better cardiovascular health than the general population. Um, I think it's a good thing to be doing to keep your body in shape for, um, you know, cardiovascular wise and to, to preserve erectile function, um, but not a direct link that we are aware of. What levels of testosterone do you recommend? So the levels I recommend are those that are defined by the American Neurologic Association for Treatment Goals, which is sort of the middle tertiary of testosterone range. So we, we, depending on the lab and who you ask, low testosterone is, rel is generally defined as testosterone less than 300. Some people might say 270, some people might say 330, but it's around you know 300 or less, technically on two separate blood samples. Um, then the goal that we shoot for um, is somewhere between 450 and 700 um, when, we're, when we've got guys on replacement therapy. The upper limit of normal testosterone, again, depending on the lab you use, might be anywhere from 850 to a, like a thousand ish. Um, it depends on the specific lab and how they're running it. But we want something kind of in the middle to upper range. And most importantly, when we're replacing testosterone, not only are we treating the number, but we got to treat the patient meaning that your symptoms need to improve when you're on it. If you come see me, your testosterone is low. We give you testosterone, your number goes up, and yet you feel exactly the same. Still fatigued, still erectile dysfunction, still not performing in the gym, still not concentrating well, all the same symptoms, then it's not recommended to continue it because it's not helping you. And there are some risks um, to, to, to doing it. And we would talk about that if we initiated therapy. Um, according to the warning list that come with Viagra, a rare side effect is blindness in one or both eyes. Can you explain this? Does Cialis have the same rare side effect? So I've never seen this side effect in my, um, actually in my, in my uh, career. Um, the, in general, Viagra works by, and so does Cialis, by dilating blood vessels. Um, the name of the enzyme that, or really the name of the, the medication, it's called a PDE5 inhibitor. And basically, it's inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down nitric oxide, which is called phosphodiesterase. And so it's preventing that enzyme from breaking down nitric oxide. And nitric oxide makes blood vessels get bigger. Um, it dilates them. And so what that can do is sometimes it can lower blood pressure. Sometimes it does it asymmetrically in different areas within the body. And so sometimes blood flow can go down um, to one eye or another. Some men will have I've never heard of a case of permanent blindness, but in, uh, I've heard of cases of like transient temporary blindness. It's not uncommon for some men to get like a blue hue to their vision, that kind of a thing. But it does tend to be more common in Viagra because 
It's a, as we talked about earlier on, a faster acting uh, medication uh, that reaches its peak more quickly and then drops off more quickly too. But for that reason, sometimes the side effects can be a little bit more um, intense. Um, so, you know, I, I have not actually seen that in my career in any of my own patients. It is quite rare. Um, but, you know, um, I also tell people that there are some pretty rare bad side effects to taking things like Tylenol and ibuprofen. There's always side effects going to be listed. For most men, it's not going to be a, a big problem. Um, and then also, okay, we're getting to the end here, but still coming. I have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Is this a contributing factor to ED? Yeah, I mean, it certainly could be. Um, you know, in general, if your heart is thick, which is what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, and it has trouble pumping blood efficiently to the rest of the body, uh, particularly if you have a reduced ejection fraction, meaning that your body's not delivering blood as efficiently with every pump of the heart, then it is possible that could be a contributor, um, you know, which, which is the same for any cardiovascular uh, issue potentially. Um, and then would dual lift on top of gains wave work is another type of thing. Yeah. I, I kind of answered that one earlier for another gentleman, but yeah, I think if you've already taken, or if you've already tried one versus the other, it probably in my opinion, probably is not going to do you any good to try the other one. I can't guarantee that because, again, you're probably getting it from a different technician, possibly slightly different technique or protocol. Um, but in general, you know, I think the guys in which that might be beneficial is if you tried one, uh, you got some, you know, semblance of a benefit. You felt like your erections were stronger for a little while, maybe not completely, but a little better. Then, yeah, it might be worth it. But it's really hard to say um, because, again, there's there's no testing or evaluation or physical exam finding that we can look to, to try to help us predict that. Um, and then can you prescribe medication like Viagra or Cialis for men taking heart medication? My cardiac cardiologist says I can't use them. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, you know, without knowing more information, it's hard to say, but I do in my practice generally, if there's a patient who is on, you know, beyond kind of a standard blood pressure medication, but maybe on medication for a specific heart condition. Um, and there's a question about that. I will always defer to the cardiologist. The concern would be that if we, you know, are giving you a medication that's going to lower your blood pressure, um, which is what Viagra and Cialis can do, if your heart is not strong enough or your veins are not competent enough to maintain adequate blood flow to your heart, then it could precipitate a heart attack or a stroke. So, you know, I, I would always defer to the cardiologist on that. If they say that it's not a good idea, then I tell my patients it's not a good idea. Um, in which case, then we maybe try one of the other options we've discussed tonight. Um, and, and the good thing about treatment for erectile dysfunction is there are multiple options. Um, and, and in guys who can't have one uh, treatment option, they, they might, might be able to go for the other one. So um, certainly I would encourage any man um, on this, this talk tonight, uh, any friends that you have that you know are struggling with this, you know, make an appointment with, um, with us, uh, with me. I'm happy to see you with one of my colleagues. There's a couple other folks in our office. Um, Jackie Milos is also fellowship trained in, uh, men's health reconstruction, uh, prosthetics, a couple other, uh, partners of mine who do prosthetics heavily. We can find somebody for you in the practice. That's a good fit based on your location, your insurance coverage, all that kind of stuff. It's always worth a conversation. The last thing I'd want is for a guy to say, I wish I would have known sooner, or I wish I would have done this five or 10 years earlier come and get the information. And then from there, you get to decide, you know, it's your body, uh, what you want to do, but we're, we're here to help you with it. So, um, I don't see any other, uh, questions in the queue right now. So I think I'm going to wrap up there. I really appreciate everybody for tuning in, um, this evening and hopefully, um, look forward to seeing you sometime again in the future. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a great evening.